Awesome. It was a great night last night, and it was such an honor to be there and to be a part of a church here uh, that rallies around this community, not only families in your church, uh, but this church is serving families all around the community, which is incredible, but to be a part of. Uh, my name's Jason, and it's such a privilege to be with you here this morning. I come to you from uh, Houston. I get to travel around the country, and normally I get on a plane in Houston, and wherever I land, it feels better where I land. This is the only place where it doesn't feel better. It actually felt worse. So, uh, but I do feel a little bit at home uh, and sweating a lot here. Just feel next week I'm in Iowa. I'm a little concerned because I think it's going to be cold and we don't know how to do cold, do we? But it's good to be here. Uh, the best way for me to introduce myself to you is to actually show you a picture of the world that I come from. Uh, and so uh, this is the very female, uh, very estrogen-filled world that I live in. And so let me explain very quickly. Uh, that's my wife there, Emily, in the back. Uh, we've been married 20 years this past June. We met on the campus of Texas A&M University. There's always at least one of you uh, whooping crazy ones. If you're one of the crazy ones, come find me after. Uh, and uh, that is our set of girls. So there in the, the royal blue is Darby. Uh, there next to her in the gray tank top is Presley. Second from the left is Macy. They were six, four, and two when we became foster parents and welcomed Marley there in the glasses at the front into our home. She was our very first placement. She was three days old in the city of Houston. Uh, and uh, we say it this way, that we have had the uh, uh, fortunate but unfortunate privilege of adopting her into our family. Fortunate in the sense that uh, we love that she's our daughter and that we get to call her our daughter and that we get to be her mommy and daddy. Unfortunate in the sense that we wish that none of this was ever even a part of her story. We wish that she was able to go back home. We wish that mom was healthy. We wish that all of that could have happened. And so we have lived in this tension for the last 10 years. And then about five years into our journey, uh, my wife became aware of some situations. And I don't know how your marriage works, but when my wife becomes aware of a situation, that's the equivalent of us having prayed about it and talked about it for a long, long, long time. <laughs> Really, the decision's made, and then my job is to figure out how we're going to make it happen. And that can be anything from, I've got a DIY home project idea for you, and it's just, it's done in her head. My job is to figure out how to make it happen. Or it can be as extreme as, I've become aware of a 17-year-old and a little baby boy, and they don't have a place to live, and I think they need to move in with us. All but done in her head, my job is to figure out how to make that happen. And so, Guiana there on the far left, when she was 17, she moved into our home. She had grown up in foster care since she was six years old, and uh, now she had little baby Jordan in her, uh, in her orbit and in her world. Uh, they spent the first week of his life sleeping on a caseworker's floor in Dallas uh, because they had a hard time finding a home for a teenager with a long rap sheet and a little baby, because that's just the reality of the world of foster care. The older these kids get, the harder they are to place, the more likely they are to age out to practically nothing. And so my wife became aware of this, and they moved in when Guiana was about 17 and a half. Jordan was a couple of weeks old, and they've been a part of our family for the last five years. Uh, this picture is our most recent outdated family picture. You'll see another little baby there in the middle, and it's so outdated that there's actually now a third baby in the mix of our family. And so we love Guiana, and we love babies. We don't love Guiana having babies, and we talk to her about that often. Uh, and... Uh, the reality is this, is that Guiana is not without her struggles. And the reality, frankly, for all of us is that we are not without our struggles. And what's true for all of us is that as we struggle and as we stumble through life, what we need most are people around us to help support us and be there for us. And so our commitment to Guiana from day one has been this. Look, no matter what, you're stuck with us forever. You're stuck with us forever. And five years in, and she doesn't fully yet believe that because no one in her life has ever given her reason to believe that. And so our hope and our prayer one day is that she wakes up one day soon and she just rests in the fact that there are people who are stuck with her forever and that she lean into that. And so that's a little bit of our journey. I'll share some of her story and our story together as we continue this morning. But uh, I love stories and I love good stories and I especially love good stories uh, in, in the middle of a media news cycle that is mostly filled with bad stories. I frankly don't pay very much attention to the news anymore because it's just, it just is kind of like drinking from uh, the poisonous fire hydrant at times, right? 
you just start to feel like my, my soul is just, is just weighed down with all this. But every once in a while, a bright spot story kind of cuts through all the noise. And my favorite stories are the ones of kind of the Good Samaritan stories. People come up upon something and they do something heroic. It's, it could be as uh, crazy as an 18-wheeler flips over. It's crushing a car and some guys get out of their trucks, probably Florida guys, big Texas or Florida, big guys, big trucks. Uh, and a few of them get around the 18-wheeler and like in this superhuman, supernatural strength lifted up just enough for the person to crawl out to safety. Like those are the stories. And those are the stories that kind of draw us in and compel us and cut through the noise of the bad stories. I recently came across a story like this and it's one of these stories that causes you to pause and consider, what would I do in a situation like that? What would I do in a situation like that? And so watch this story that I came across out of Southern California. A guy comes across a burning car in a parking lot and he responds a certain way, and his friend responds in a very different way. And we're left to consider, gosh, what would I do in a situation like that? Watch this. <clears throat> Maybe you guys can help Just me out back there. Before this car went up in flames, we get the driver there? was pulled out by a good Samaritan on his way to lunch at the Bollinger Road shopping plaza. Rob Harutsunyan says there were dozens of bystanders, but no one stepped up. He's in the white shirt, and you can see him run up to the driver and pull and drag him to safety before paramedics and firefighters arrive. His friend Leo shot this video of the rescue and put it on YouTube. I was pretty surreal once we started. I love that story. Aram comes across a burning car. He recognizes there's a guy in the car, and his response is to run towards the car and pull the guy out. And then maybe my favorite part of that story is at the very end, the reporter says, and his friend Leo stood nearby and recorded it on his phone and posted it on YouTube. And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine with being Leo in that situation, right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, we live in a world that is becoming increasingly full of Leos, don't we? We all carry around uh, cameras in our pockets, and we're really good at getting just close enough to get a good shot, but staying just far enough away to not get burned by anything. And we watch stories like this, and we're compelled to consider, what would I do in a situation like this? Would I run towards the burning car, or would I stay just far enough away to not get burned, but close enough to get a good shot and post it on YouTube? What's my response in a situation like this? You know, we largely live in a culture that has a, a particular narrative that all of us on some level uh, experience and feel and are keenly aware of. Tim Keller, a pastor and an author, says it this way. He says that in order for us to really understand the implications and the gravity of the narrative of the gospel, we first have to understand the implications and the narrative and the gravity of the cultural narrative around us. And as we increasingly understand the cultural narrative in which we live, and then increasingly understand the gospel narrative in which we believe, we will begin to see where those two things come in conflict with one another. And then at some point in the midst of that conflict, we have to decide something's got to give. Something's got to give. These two, two things cannot coexist equally. We largely live in a culture that is driven by a narrative that suggests this. The goal of our life is to be comfortable and convenient and safe. And so when you come upon the burning car, stay away. Isolate and insulate. You can even go so far as to say it this way. You could say that the goal of our life, according to the culture around us, is this. Go to school, make good grades so you can get into a good college, you can get a good degree that gets you a good salary, marry a good guy or girl, live in a good neighborhood, have a really good house, have a few good kids, drive some good cars, take some good vacations so that you can have a good Instagram profile and then have a really good retirement uh, and then hopefully you die in your sleep or how, if you somehow peacefully go and, that's, and it's just good and calm and then your kids kind of uh, hopefully kind of repeat that cycle, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat and the goal is to be good and comfortable and safe and to avoid and isolate from anything that is potentially difficult or that might disrupt that. That is largely the cultural narrative around us. And then we come across stories like this, and we go, gosh, I want to be the kind of person. I want to be the kind of person who would run towards the burning car, but I'm just not sure because I live under the weight of this cultural narrative. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to see where the gospel narrative begins to counteract and conflict with that cultural narrative, and then we're going to ask ourselves some questions. Because what we begin to see as the gospel increasingly presses itself down into us, it begins to change and shift a lot of the questions that we ask 
as we increasingly become aware of the implications of the gospel through us. And so we're going to spend most of our time this morning in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through, uh, verse 4 through 7, actually. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to read this, and then we're just going to go back through it verse by verse and pick it apart uh, and draw out some implications and ask ourselves some questions. And then in the end, we're going to invite you to consider what your unique particular response might be. And so let me read through this. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. <sighs> That's a lot. So if you were to come up to me and say, Jason, uh, imagine this, you are stranded on a desert island. I would say, just great, that sounds great, stop right there, when do we leave, right? You say, no, 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 Matt, play this out. You're in a shipwreck and, and you're stranded on a desert island and everything's been destroyed, even most of your Bible, but you're left with just a few verses in the Bible. What verses would you choose? And I'd make a pretty strong argument for Galatians 4, verse 4 through 7. It tells us so much about who God is and what God does, the implications of his work on our behalf, and then ultimately the implications of how we then live that out and demonstrate it. And so let's start in Galatians 4, verse 4. This is actually my favorite Christmas verse. And can you believe that Christmas is next month? Isn't that wild to even say, right? And you guys get it. We're, we're in South Texas. You're in Florida. Like, we are, we're just days away from uh, going outside and putting up Christmas lights and decorating the outside of our house and just sweating the whole time and, and just, uh, just got this very visceral reaction and this very real sense of the world is not how it's supposed to be. I think that in heaven one day, when we go out and put Christmas lights on whatever house we have there, the weather's just going to be perfect, Right? So hope is on its way, right? But we're all going to start doing that soon, and this is what we're celebrating at Christmas. Next month is crazy. When the fullness of time had come, that phrase literally means at just the right time. And so you could read it this way. At just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. We know her name to be Mary. And so there, right, right there is Christmas. At just the right time, Jesus was born through Mary. Now, Verse four has an additional statement. It says, born under the law. The, the connotation there is, that, uh, is this idea of born under a weight, under the weight of condemnation. So we don't talk a lot about that at Christmas. As a matter of fact, we don't talk at all about that at Christmas, really, because that's not very happy Christmas manger magi talk, right? We save that for a good Friday at Easter, but of course it's true at Christmas. Jesus himself in his ministry said, I was, I've come into this world to die. I have come into this world to give my life as a ransom, to lay my life down. Ultimately, he says, I have been born into this world to be crushed by this world. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. If you were in a seminary class, the professor might say, this is what we call the doctrine of incarnation. The doctrine of incarnation. So here's what I like. I like to take big complex things and make it just as simple as possible for me to understand. And so here's how I understand the doctrine of incarnation. And I suspect that every time I use this illustration, my, my very distinguished seminary professors are just rolling over in their graves wishing I would stop saying this. Uh, but I, I don't because it just makes sense to me and I think it'll be helpful for you. I'm about to give you a gift. You ready for this? So I'm pretty sure in Florida you have uh, the same thing that we do in Texas these restaurants that we call Tex-Mex restaurants, which is basically fake Mexican food, right? Palatable, Americanized Mexican food. And then Texas has said, we can do whatever we want, so we're just going to make it our own and call it Tex-Mex uh, food. Sometimes I'll be in Seattle or up in the Northeast, and they'll say, hey, we want you to feel at home while you're with us. We're going to take you out for Mexican food. And I think, I don't know if Seattle Mexican is the same as like Tex-Mex, right? I'm a little concerned, right? And so, uh, most of the time, actually, I'll be, just be frank, uh, my wife and I aren't very adventurous people. We're actually quite boring. We eat the same things. We go to the same restaurants. We sit at the same booths. We order the same things when we go. But every once in a while, we'll like, get this, uh, this spark in us. We're like, let's try something new. And then we kind of laugh at each other. Ha, ha, like that's actually going to happen. But we'll spend like 15 minutes talking about what, what it would be like if we actually tried something new, right? 
And then 15 minutes later, we just go with what we know. And so not long ago, we were actually driving across town uh, to uh, go eat. And the whole way on our way over there, we were thinking, hey, there's this new restaurant. There's this new place we can try, this new place we can try. And then I think we kind of blacked out for a minute. And when we woke up, the car had pulled itself into our favorite taco place. And we we're like, I guess this is just where we're going. And we ordered the same thing. And, uh, and what we order is the same all the time. And it includes queso. Which, queso is interesting, because if someone came to you and said, here's a big block of cheese, do you want to eat all of this at one time? We'd say, ah, oh, that feels gross and unhealthy. But if you melt it and you put a bunch of baskets of chips with it, totally in, right? <laughs> and so we order queso every time. The only adventurous thing that we do is sometimes we order queso, and sometimes we order queso con carne. <laughs> yeah. Con carne means with meat or with beef, and it's the same root word that we get the word incarne from. So when we talk about the incarnation of God, the, the birth of Jesus, really what we're talking about is God with beef on, is God with meat on. You can understand why my seminary professors <laughs> don't like what I'm doing right now, right? But as if eating queso wasn't a spiritual enough experience already, now I'm giving you the gift of going and eating queso con carne and it just being that much more of a spiritual experience, right? And now you can impress your friends. You can order it, and as you're eating it, you can say, you know what this reminds me of? <laughs> and they'll just be so impressed with you, and then they'll kind of talk bad about you on the way home in the car, right? Like, who's that guy, right? This is what we mean. It's God with meat on. It's God with beef on. And so we, we see this idea playing out now in the incarnation that God is the kind of God who says, I see you where you are, and I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you. This is what we celebrate at Christmas. This idea that God says, I see your brokenness, and I see the struggle, and I see the difficulty, and rather than him saying, man, it is a mess, so you guys need to get your act together, and one day maybe you can work your way to where I am. Instead, God says, I see you where you are, and I'm entering into where you are that Jesus would enter into our brokenness, literally wrap himself up in our brokenness, be carried by our brokenness to the cross, be broken by our brokenness so that we don't have to be broken anymore. That is the essence of the gospel. You know, God has every right and all the power and authority to stay up in heaven and snap his fingers and call it all fixed. But for some reason, he chooses a different way and his way is when he sees brokenness, he's compelled to move towards it and become a part of it. This is the MO of God. That God is the kind of God that moves towards and not away. Matthew chapter one says it this way, here's our Christmas verse, that his name will be Emmanuel, which means that God is with us, he's right here, in the flesh, with meat on. That God has entered into our story. And then John chapter one verse 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That phrase, made his dwelling, literally means tabernacled among us. In other words, you could read it like this, that the word Jesus became flesh, wrapped himself up in our brokenness, and he built a home in it. He stayed. In other words, it's as if Jesus is saying, look, I'm entering into your story, and you're stuck with me forever. And maybe one day you'll fully rest in that truth. Henry Nouwen says it this way. He says, compassion is not a bending towards the underprivileged from a privileged position. It's not a reaching out from on high to those who are less fortunate below. It's not a gesture of sympathy or pity for those who fail to make it in the upward pull. On the contrary, compassion means going directly to those people and places. Listen to this. What a statement. It means going directly to those people and places where suffering is most acute and building a home there. The cultural narrative around us says, when you come across those places where suffering is most acute, isolate, insulate, and avoid. And the narrative of the gospel begins to flip that script and says, when we come across places where suffering is most acute, we don't do so accidentally. We actually intentionally seek out those places where suffering is most acute, and we stay there. It becomes an entirely new reference point for our lives. You ever built a home or moved to a new neighborhood or a new city? It, it takes a while to kind of establish equilibrium and a reference point for where the streets are and where the grocery store is and just how you're gonna navigate around. In essence, there's a sense in which as the gospel uh, uh, becomes, uh, it, implications of it become more deeply embedded into who we are, it begins to shift the reference points by which we live. 
It begins to change the things that we center our lives around. That we become the kind of people that move towards and not away. Why? Because God sees hard places and broken people and moves towards them and not away from them. And so I think all of us on some level, here's what we want, here's what we want, and we struggle with this because the cultural narrative is, is heavy and it's loud. But I think on some level, all of us want to not only increasingly raise our hands in worship to a God who has moved towards us in our brokenness, but simultaneously, we also want to become the kind of people who refuse to use those same hands to push the brokenness of others away. We're tired of living in that disconnect, in that, that discord. We increasingly want to raise our hands in worship to a God that has moved towards us and simultaneously use those same hands to move towards the brokenness of others. That's what we want. That's what we want. We're tired of being the Leos, and we want to be the Arams in those stories. And so God has moved towards us. It's what he does. It's his method of operation. The whole story arc of scripture is God moving towards broken people. It's just what he does. And then Paul begins to unpack in verse four, five, and six, uh, or five, six, and seven, the implications on our lives. And so the first thing that, that is impacted when Jesus steps into our story and begins to write an entirely new story, Paul begins to unpack the implications on our past. And so in verse five, he says, to redeem those who were under the law, remember that phrase, under the law, under the weight of this crushing condemnation. Jesus was born under the weight of condemnation, verse five, to redeem those who were under that same weight of condemnation so that we might be adopted as sons. We might receive adoption. We might be introduced into an entirely new reality, new family, new provision, new protection from God. So in verse five, the first implication that we see of the gospel as it begins to change our story is this, is that our past is redeemed. That's past tense language. We were once under the weight of condemnation and then Jesus took our place there and redeemed us out from underneath it. Our past has been redeemed. In Romans chapter eight, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. There is therefore now no condemnation. You know, we're taught on some level uh, that, that our past is a source of shame, it's a source of embarrassment, the things that maybe we've done, or perhaps even the things that have been done to us. And on some level, we wish that the gospel was Jesus stepping into our story and erasing all memory of the past, as if it never happened. I remember growing up in Sunday school, maybe VBS, and you know, sometimes we try to be real cute in the Christian world and our cuteness like uh, at, the, at the sacrifice of actually what's right theology sometimes, right? Uh, and so I vividly remember being taught in maybe a VBS setting that the word justified, what it means is it's just as if, kind of play on words with justified, just as if it never happened. And I understand the sentiment, but then you walk away going, but it did happen. Like it's still there, the memory is still there, the grief is still there, the trauma is still there, the feeling is still there. Why doesn't Jesus just, just erase all of that? Because I think he actually has a better way for us. You know, our past are no longer sources of, of condemnation and shame and embarrassment. They now, in the gospel, have the capacity to become platforms of celebration. No longer sources of condemnation, now platforms of celebration, why? Because we can say, look at what Jesus has done. I was once dead and now I'm alive. I was once blind and now I can see. I was once lame and now I can walk. I was once riddled by addiction or shame or guilt or embarrassment or fear, but Jesus. It's a platform of celebration. The gospel has the capacity to change the relationship that we have with our own past. Not erase our past, but change the relationship that we have with it. So not long after Guiana moved into our home, it was one of those days where like the goal of the day is, are all of our kids home, and did everyone at least eat something today? Even if it's like a Pop-Tart and a Sprite, right? Did everyone eat something, and are we all home? Great. Mommy and Daddy are going to our room. 
don't bother us. We're just going to veg out on probably some Chip and Jojo at the time or something like that, right? One of those days, we all understand. And then we hear a faint knock on our bedroom door late one night, and uh, it is followed by a three-word question uh, that nothing simple or short ever follows. And the question was, hey, can we talk, right? That, there is never a simple or short conversation that follows that question. And we say, of course, come on in. And it was Guiana, and she says, hey, I've been thinking about what I want to be when I grow up. This is a 17 and a half year old girl. I've been thinking about what I want to be when I grow up. We say, incredible, what are you thinking? What's on your mind? She says, I think I want to go into social work. I want to be a social worker for kids in foster care because all I ever had in my life was bad ones. And they were supposed to make things better for me, but they made things worse for me. And I want to be a good one because these kids deserve good ones. So, Guiana, how horrible is it that the job even has to exist? How beautiful would it be for you to be the one to walk into a room, look a kid in the eye who's just had one of the worst days of their life, and say, hey, your story is my story, and my story is yours. I'm here with you, and you're stuck with me. How incredible would that be? You know, what struck us that night was that Guiana was dreaming about the future, and the, her dreams for the future were actually rooted in her past. Hey, I've had a really horrible, horrible, horrible life. And I refuse to let that drag me down or to use that as an excuse. Maybe on some level there's, there's a way that I can use the horribleness of my past for good moving forward. And to that we would say yes and amen. Absolutely. The first thing that changes when Jesus steps in our story is that our past is redeemed. And then Paul continues in verse 6. He says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. This is now present tense language. Because you are sons right now, you have the Spirit of God in you right now, and that Spirit gives you the capacity to refer to God and relate to God in an entirely new way. So not only as Father, but also as Abba. Very similar words, slightly different connotations. Abba has a more tender and affectionate connotation. And so it's the difference between my girls calling me Father, which they don't, right? I imagine if they did, it'd be a very British accent, very proper, right? Instead, they call me Daddy. That's my name, not even dad. I don't respond to dad, I'm daddy. And I'm gonna ride the daddy train as long as I can, right? I uh, texted my 17 year old not long ago and she didn't respond and I came home and saw that her phone was on the counter in the kitchen and uh, I had walked by it and I saw my text pop up again uh, and the name on the text was dad. And so I quickly logged in and fixed that all capital letters, daddy, parentheses, don't ever change it, right? Now listen, I'm the only guy that lives in my house, trust me, I've, I look often, Are there, is there anybody else here to help me? Uh, and there's not, uh, and so I'm the only dad, I'm the only father. But what's more important for me right now for my girls to understand is not so much that I'm father, but that I'm daddy. And you understand why. There's a connotation there, there's an approachability there, there's a safety there, there's a security there. Scripture says that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. On what grounds can we approach the throne of a holy God with confidence? On the grounds that we know exactly how he's gonna respond to us no matter what we bring to him. That's what we all want for our kids. You can always talk to me. You can always bring even the hardest things to us with absolute confidence and assurance of how we're going to respond to you. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence knowing exactly how God feels about us. He's not embarrassed by us. He's not angry with us. He's not disappointed in us. All of that has been poured out on the back of Jesus and so we can come to him freely and confidently and intimately and affectionately. This is our new present reality. Our past has been redeemed and it has introduced us into this new present. Our present has been shifted. I once had to be afraid of what God thought of me. I once wondered if he was upset with me, and now I don't have to wonder anymore. I know exactly how he feels about me because his spirit has given me the ability to refer to him and relate to him as dad, as daddy. There's an approachability, there's a, there's a safety and a security there. Part of the reason that we move towards and not away, part of the reason that we step into the lives of hurting people and struggling people, vulnerable children and specifically vulnerable families that are affected by the child and family welfare system Part of the reason that we do that is on one sense because we are the kind of people that believe God has the capacity to change our relationship with our past. And so, so if we believe that's true for us, we must also then believe it's true for others who are condemned by their past, 
who are buried in their past, who are fighting tooth and nail to change the trajectory of their future, and they just need some people to come alongside of them and help them do that. For us to be able to look at the Guianas and say, it doesn't always have to be this way, and you're stuck with us forever, let's do this. We're gonna walk with you through this. Your brokenness is our brokenness. We'll be broken by your brokenness so that on some level, you don't have to be broken anymore. We're gonna introduce you into a new present reality, one that's not marked by the need to survive or fight or claw or manipulate your way through the day, but one that is now marked by a sense of security and provision and protection and safety. You can just rest knowing that you are fully loved and fully cared for and you have people that are stuck with you forever. And then Paul continues. In verse seven, he says this, and you're no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. This is now future tense language. Our past has been redeemed, our present has been shifted, and our future has been changed as well. We all know what an heir is. An heir is someone who lives today with the assurance of what's to come tomorrow that we live today with, with a promise and a guarantee of what's to come tomorrow. So real quickly, any time that we read about what's to come tomorrow in our future in Scripture, we see a couple of predominant themes that, that run a parallel course with each other, but also intersect with each other. So the first theme that we see uh, in Scripture as it relates to what's to come in our future is this, is number one, glory is coming. Glory is coming. It says that while our outward bodies waste away, our inward souls, along with all of creation, groan for the glory that will be revealed. And while we experience a certain weight to our struggles now, it pales in comparison to the weight of glory that is coming. Promise number one, in terms of what's to come in our future, is this, glory is coming. Another way of saying that is that in the end, Jesus wins. Like there is an absolute, certain, assured victory that is coming, and right now, you're not fighting for victory, you are living from the victory that has been promised to you that's coming. That one day, everything that's wrong will be made right. Final things will not, broken things will not be final things. But all things will be made new. Glory is coming. Now, we love that promise. That sells a lot of books and it fills a lot of churches. The second promise is a lot harder to swallow and nobody buys this book and nobody wants to stay at this church very long. But it's equally true and just as beautiful and very much needed with the first promise because it makes the first promise that much better. The first promise is that glory is coming and Jesus wins and we can live in victory and look forward to that victory one day. The second promise is this, hey, it's going to be increasingly difficult along the way. You're like, yeah, I'm not buying that book, right? I'm gonna find a nicer church too that just tells me I live from victory. You do. You live from victory and you have to believe that because it's going to become increasingly difficult along the way. You know, Jesus never says, follow me, it's just gonna get easier from here, guys. As a matter of fact, he says, follow me and there's gonna come a day when everyone turns on you. You know, I'd like to suggest that maybe even the, the current cultural and political climate that we live in that is increasingly becoming antagonistic and even legislatively against the things of God, that God is not surprised by at all. As a matter of fact, he very well might be saying to us, I told you, this is what I told you was going to happen. It's going to become increasingly difficult along the way, but in the end I win. In the end, I win. In the end, glory is coming. That is our future hope. Gianna knocks on our door that night and says, I'm starting to dream about what I wanna be in the future, and we understand that it's largely rooted in her past, but what struck us most about that was not so much that she was beginning to understand maybe my past can be used for good moving forward, but what struck us most was the fact that she was even dreaming about her future in the first place. Because what we understand about trauma, neurobiologically, physically in our brain, trauma destroys the brain's ability to dream or imagine. So let's play it out this way. Imagine that uh, a little kid has a near drowning experience. We pull that kid out of the pool and we put him up on the edge and we help him collect his breath and kind of uh, you know, get himself together and then we say, all right, buddy, you ready to get back in the pool? And that kid immediate, is immediately thinking, I can't imagine getting back in that water. Why, because that traumatic experience has begun to tell his brain, don't even imagine. 
And then trauma runs its course and it goes so far as to convince our brains that we don't even like the thing that traumatized us. So eventually that little boy grows up deciding, I don't even like swimming. And what we know to be true is, no, you love swimming. Trauma has just destroyed your ability to ever, to dream or imagine what it would ever be like to get back in the water again. Maybe you've been traumatized by relationships or people that were supposed to love you and didn't love you. And then you go, you know what? I can't even imagine loving or ever feeling loved again. And you know what? I don't even, I don't even like relationships. I don't even need people. We go, no, 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 we know that you do. Trauma has just destroyed your ability to ever imagine or dream what it would be like to love and be loved. Trauma destroys our capacity to dream or imagine. Guiana knocks on our door that night and says, I'm starting to think about what I want to be in the future. This says to us that her brain and her body and her spirit and her soul are starting to uh, experience a little bit of space and a little bit of healing and open herself up a little bit to no longer be concerned or worried or fearful of what's to come tomorrow, but actually to maybe be a little bit hopeful. Part of the reason that we step into and towards and move towards hard places and broken people is because that's exactly what God has done for us and because we are people that believe that God has the capacity to change relationships with the past, establish new present realities, and fill people with a future hope. We don't know what's gonna happen in our world tomorrow or what's gonna happen in our world next week. We have no idea. But you know what? We don't have to be afraid of any of it because we have an absolute future hope that in the end, Jesus wins over all of this. So let me land the plane. What does this mean for us? I think it means that there are implications that are clear, that we want to increasingly become the kind of people that deeply celebrate the gospel and demonstrate that gospel, but the applications of that gospel are broad and unique and diverse. We all celebrate the same gospel, but we don't demonstrate that gospel in the same way. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in Kansas City a few years ago, uh, they were hosting a very large foster family appreciation dinner, much like the one last night. A couple of hundred foster families in the room at a downtown Baptist church catered by a barbecue restaurant in Kansas City. If you've ever been to Kansas City, they talk about, I feel like they only talk about two things, Patrick Mahomes and barbecue. Like, that's all they care about. Two things that honestly, remember, tacos and queso, that's me. I don't, I'm not even... Barbecue and football, not really my jam, uh, but you know, whatever. So this guy comes up at the end of the night and he announces himself to me as the owner of the restaurant that catered the meal that night. The guy looked like a smoke pit, smelled like a smoke pit, talked like a smoke pit, like a human. I'm pretty sure he was a transformer, like he could become a, a smoke pit and then turn into a human. And the human version of him was talking to me, just this massive smoke pit man, and he says, hey bud, and I don't like when people call me bud, but when smoke pit man calls you bud, you're just like, yes sir. He says, hey bud, I'm not bringing a kid into my home, and in my head, I'm thinking, thank God, please don't, you're a terrifying human being, right? <laughs> he says, I'm not bringing a kid into my home, but I own the best barbecue restaurant in Kansas City. And we've told agencies and organizations that anytime there is a foster family function or a family brings a new placement into their home, I'm gonna be the first one there delivering the best barbecue in Kansas City for free. And to that guy, I say yes and amen. Here's a guy who says, I know what I can't do, but I know what I can do, and I can do it extremely well. And I'm gonna bring that to the table for the good of the whole. This, I believe, is a beautiful expression of what we mean when we talk about the body of Christ. Romans says it this way, as in one body we have many members, the members don't all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, we are individually members of one another. In another part of scripture it says that you're like an ear and I'm an eye and she's a hand and he's a foot and their arms and their toes and their, their fingers and their, uh, their shoulders and like all of us collective diversity coming together make up the body. We are individually members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us so let us use them. And the barbecue guy says I know what my gift is. I know what God's given me. I know what resources, opportunities, experiences, expertises he's given me, and maybe I can bring that to the table for the good of the whole. We're not all called to do the same thing, but we're all capable of doing something, and we believe that everyone can do something. The somethings represented in this room are as unique 
and diverse and creative as each individual person in this room. This is how the body of Christ works, that you be the best ear you can be so someone else can be the best eye they can be. I've gotten a list of some things that people in this church are already doing. They've creatively said, I know what I can do, and this is gonna be my something. Uh, a filling the freezer program for foster families where over 1,000 meals have been given to foster families already. Uh, prayer ministry where every family is prayed over. Uh, um, a lady bakes birthday cakes for every kid and a family that she serves. Um, uh, James Gang, something here. I, uh, I guess, probably some people that build stuff. They built a play set for a grandmother that's caring for five kids. Uh, a volunteer does yard work and home repairs for a single uh, adoptive mom in the community. And you could just go on and on and on and on and on. And so the question is not, uh, do I have something to offer? The question is, what is my something? What is my something? That's really the question. What's my something? You know, as the gospel embeds itself more deeply into the fabric of our lives, it begins to shift the narrative by which we live and the questions that we ask. It is no longer why would I move towards some hard and difficult places, but it's now in light of what Jesus has done for me, why would I not? Why would I not? And it's no longer do I have something and can I do something, it's now in light of what I know to be true about how the body of Christ works. What is my something? What is my barbecue story? I'm gonna invite the band up as we, we, we close uh, and just throw a couple of things out at you and then pray for you. There are people in this room right now that know what their something is. And maybe what you've been doing is you have been um, masking, uh, let's just, can we just be honest? I'm good at this. So I, I'm really, really good at what I'm about to say. That's why I'm able to say it the way I'm able to say it. I have a lot of personal experience with uh, masking my disobedience uh, in spirituality. Meaning, God, I know what you want me to do, but I'm just gonna keep like praying about it for a long time and studying about it for a long time. And it looks real spiritual on the outside, but on the inside, it's just disobedience. It's like if I, went, if I told my kids, hey, I want you to clean your room, and they're like, okay, we memorized what you said, clean your room. Like, that's great, it's not that hard, right? I don't want you to memorize it, just do it, right? They go, well, before we do it, we're gonna go to a conference, and it's a, it's a conference where we, uh, a bunch of people get together and we talk about theoretically what it would look like if we cleaned our rooms. I'm like, well, that's strange, but okay. Uh, and then, you're, then they come back and they're like, hey, we're real inspired, we're actually gonna start some small groups in our community, and it's gonna, we're gonna get together every, you know, for six weeks, and we're gonna talk about conceptually what it might look like if we clean our rooms. I'm like, that's very strange, have you cleaned your room yet? No, 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 we'll get there, but we just have some things to do first. I'm like, no, 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 just stop all of that. Clean your room. No, no, we just need some more clarity. I've been clear. I'm done talking about it. I think that's what every parent would say. We're not talking about it anymore. Clean your room. You ever feel like maybe God's not answering your prayer or God's not responding? And what if it's the case that God's up there going, conversation's over. You know what you need to do. Shift your prayers from God, I need more clarity, to God, actually what I really need is more courage. And that's an entirely different prayer. Others of you are like, I don't know, I just came in here, I didn't know what to expect, and then you tell a barbecue story, you know, a guy about barbecue, and I'm like, I, I think I can do something. And we say yes and amen to that, and we wanna know who you are, and you have the opportunity to connect right after this service to just begin to explore that conversation. That's all. Just begin to explore that conversation and see what God might have for you. So let me pray for us, and then a pastor's gonna come up and close our time. Father, we do ask that first and foremost, the gospel would embed itself deeply in our lives. And for those in this room who say, I need a new relationship with my past, I need a new present reality, I need a future hope, I don't know these things to be true in my own life, then it starts there. And I pray that this morning might be an opportunity for them to respond for the first time to the beautiful work of Jesus on their behalf. And for others, I pray that you would help us more deeply embed these truths in our lives. And then consider the implications and the applications for what our something might be to demonstrate widely what you have done so beautifully. So give us the courage and the clarity that we need by your spirit to take our next best steps forward. 
Amen.